Good afternoon. Welcome to the subcommittee on the planning dispositions and concessions. I'm council member Ben Kalos. That's at Ben Kalos to anyone on social media who wishes to talk about the exciting items before our committee. I have the privilege of chairing this subcommittee. We're joined today by uh, council member Ruben Diaz Sr. Uh, today we'll be holding hearings on two projects, land use item 257, Clinton URA site 7, and land use item 258, 590 Southern Boulevard. If you're here to testify, please fill out a speaker slip with the sergeant at arms and indicate the land use number of the item you wish to testify on on that slip. Before we begin our hearings, uh, or throughout the process of our hearings, we will vote to approve land use item 232 at Park and Elton in land use chair Salamanca's district in the Bronx, and land use item 240, MEC 125th Street in Council Member Ayala's district in Manhattan. Both projects are the subject of hearings held on November 1st. The approval of land use item 232 will facilitate the development of a 37 housing unit affordable to households with income ranges of 27 to 90 percent of AMI. Do we have the uh, translation into actual incomes? Which is roughly incomes of $21,930 a year to uh, about between fifty-eight and seventy-three thousand dollars a year, including six homeless set-aside units. All of these units will be subject to rent stabilization. Specifically, HPD is seeking an amendment of the previously approved Urban Development Action Area Project for property located at three one two zero Park Avenue, Block two four one eight, Lot sixteen, and four fifty one East one fifty ninth Street. Block 2381 and Lot 43 in the Bronx. This application also requests approval of a tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. Land Use Chair Salamanca is supportive of this application. In Land Use 240, MEC 125th Street, HPD is seeking approval of a new tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. The approval of Land Use 240 will facilitate the development of 404 residential units including 268 affordable and 134 market rate, more than 62,000 square feet of commercial space, 5,800 square feet for a cultural community facility, 10,000 square feet of public open space, and 121 parking spaces. In 2008, the City Council approved the rezoning, UDAP designation, urban renewal plan amendment, and disposition for all the lots in this project, Block 1790, Lots 1356, parts of Lot 8, 41, 44, 45, 46, and 101. After a 2006 RFP related to these properties had been issued by the New York City Economic Development Corporation, Council Member Ayala is supportive of this project. Uh, we will hold on a vote on these two items and proceed with a hearing on the items previously mentioned. Our First item will be Land Use 257, Clinton URA Site 7 in Speaker Johnson's District in Manhattan. This proposed Article 11 tax exemption will facilitate the completion of a project at 540 West 53rd Street in Hell's Kitchen neighborhood of Manhattan that will consist of one residential building with 103 affordable dwelling units, over 20,000 square feet of commercial space, and about 2,500 square feet of open space. The Council previously approved an Article 11 tax exemption in 2014 under Resolution 527, but the project has taken longer than anticipated to receive a permanent certificate of occupancy, so this approval is needed to amend the prior resolution to extend the completion deadline for the project. The prior resolution must also be amended to extend the tax exemption to the commercial space in the exemption area while the building is under construction. I'll now open the public hearing on land use item 257, Clinton URA site 7, and would like to invite HPD to present its testimony. I'd like the council to uh, please administer the oath. If you could please state your name for the record. Please state your name. Uh, Genevieve Michael. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to answer all council member questions honestly? I do. Please begin. Land use number 257 consists of an exemption area located at 540 West 53rd Street, block 1081, part of lot 1, aka lot 50. That is Sorry also. Sorry to interrupt. May we have copies of your testimony? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, 
uh, that is also known as Site 7 within the Clinton Urban Renewal Area in Manhattan Council District 3. 540 West 53rd Street is part of a three-parcel development site that was pre that previously received ULURP approval for the Urban Development Action Area designation, project approval, and disposition by the City Council on June 26, 2014, Resolution Number 333, followed by approval of Article 11 Tax Benefits on December 17, 2014, Resolution 527. The sponsor for Clinton Site 7 acquired title to the project area in April 2015 under HPD's Mixed income program, which facilitates new construction of multiple dwelling buildings for families with a mix of incomes. The Clinton Site 7 project includes the new construction of a 103-unit permanently affordable rental building with units affordable to families earning between 80% and 155% of the area median income, AMI, as well as commercial space and community gardens. Currently, construction on the relevant portion of Lot 1 is ongoing and will include 14 studios, 37 one-bedrooms, 47 two-bedrooms, and three, or sorry, and four three-bedroom apartments, plus one superintendent's unit. Therefore, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking to amend Resolution 527 from 2014, which approved the tax benefits for the exemption area, provided that the building received a permanent certificate of occupancy on or before 30 months from the effective date of April 30th, 2015. Given the project has not yet received a permanent certificate of occupancy as of yet, the prior resolution must be amended to extend the completion deadline. Additionally, the prior resolution requires amending to extend the tax exemption to the commercial space during construction. Currently, the cumulative value of the Article 11 tax exemption is approximately uh, 40 million one hundred and ninety three thousand five hundred and sixty four and the net present value is eleven million two hundred and twenty eight thousand nine hundred and twenty one dollars all other aspects of the project remain the same one of the items we're most interested in learning in the council and our oversight role is uh, when projects go wrong why and hopes that we can learn from our mistakes as we move forward uh, why didn't this building at 540 West 53rd Street that ostensibly appears to be on the appropriate path four years is a little longer than I think it should have taken. I think it's usually supposed to take three years. So I guess what was the initial delay? Why did it take four years? And why has it not obtained a permanent certificate of occupancy as scheduled? Uh, my understanding is there have been various construction delays on the side of the developer, not on the HPD side. Uh, is this a developer that HPD has? What's the name of the developer? Uh, Clinton Housing Development Corporation. Is it a special purpose uh, developer or do they have other projects? They have other projects. And are those projects experiencing similar delays? Um, I'm not sure that I can speak across the board to their portfolio. Could you share with us whether or not this project, if this is not HPD's fault, uh, if would you share which other projects this current developer has, and if those are also experiencing similar problems, or if those are all on track? Yeah, we can chat with Council Land Use about the best way to share that. Sure. Uh, tell, tell me about the commercial space. Is that going to be available to mom and pops, or is it earmarked to be a bank, or what, what is the vision for the commercial space? I can't speak to that. I think that, you know, was up to the developer and what was negotiated in ULARP with the speaker in 2014. Okay. And we, we don't have the developer here, so we don't have any. Do you know what the total project cost is? Um, I actually do not. Okay. Uh, would you submit the pro total project cost? Yes. Would you submit the, do you, do you have the hard cost versus soft cost overall for the project? Um, I do not. We can submit it with the developer. In previous hearings, in fact, almost every hearing since I have been chair, I have asked about MWBE. Uh, whether or not people are going to be able to afford to live in the housing they are building or whether or not they will actually need to avail themselves of it. Uh, this is all information we've hoped that HPD would include in their testimony. Uh, 
Are you privy to any of that information on this project? I am not. I am extraordinarily disappointed that we've continued to ask for this information and uh, Understood. I think you know this is a little bit different than some of the projects we normally sure. bring before the committee because it's just an extension of something that was previously negotiated with the council. So many of these are. Uh, if only all the projects that HPD approved turned into sta stayed on track and didn't need to come back. Uh, moving forward, I would just ask that on pl please submit the additional information uh, relating to the questions I ask at every single hearing. And w will you? Agree to submit the additional information regarding the MWB status of the developer and the contractors that they're working with, as well as whether or not they've hit. Do you know if they hit their uh, higher NYC obligation? We'll discuss with them and submit something and follow up. Okay. Uh, similarly, on MWB prevailing, uh, what do you call it? Wage standards, any job standards. Uh, this is actually a unique situation because usually we don't actually have a finished building that just needs a CFO. So in this case, we can actually learn a lot to see what happened. Uh, were there any additional subsidies on this, or is it just the Article 11? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, would you submit the closing sheet as uh, in addition to all the other items? I believe it's public information. Let me discuss it with the team and get back to you. Um, again, this is a priority of the speaker and want to make sure that we're not doing anything outside of the realm of getting a project off track. It seems like the, the, it's on track. Do you know when they're going to get their CFO? I do not. Why are, we, why are you seeking the Article 11 extension now versus when this versus when they get the CFO, is it possible that you'll be back here next year because they still don't have the CFO? I certainly hope not. Okay. Uh, seeing no other questions, I will uh, close this hearing pending HPD providing additional information. Um, I will only close the hearing on that one item. Are there any are there any members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none. I, we, we, can, we could have had a little dance. Uh, so we're now closing the public hearing on land use item 257 after having a brief interlude for a dance, and the application will be laid over. Our second hearing today is on land use item 258, 59D Southern Boulevard in Councilmember Ayala's district. The proposed Article 11 tax exemption would facilitate the preservation of 27 unit HDFC co-op that have been a candidate for third party transfer around. 10, HPD pulled the building from third party transfer program because the progress that HGFC board had made towards resolving many outstanding issues, including routine maintenance, commercial and water sewer arrears. HPD is seeking a new full tax exemption to address the outstanding real estate tax arrears. The current tax exemption of the HGFC receives is a partial tax exemption that is set to expire in June of 2029. I now open the public hearing on land use item 59, Southern. On the land use item 590 Southern Boulevard, and would like to invite HPD to present its testimony. Uh, I'm going to ask the council to please administer the oath. Please state your name. Lacey Tauber. Luis Alguero. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. Okay, ready? I'm, um, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, LU 529 consists of an exemption area containing one privately owned, partially occupied residential building with two commercial spaces located at 590 Southern Boulevard in Bronx Council District 8, for which HPD is seeking an Article 11 tax exemption. 590 Southern Boulevard was taken into city ownership in 1978 and subsequently entered into the Community Management Program. On June 29, 1995, HPD conveyed the property to the existing occupants as a housing project for persons or families of low income, as defined in Section 576 of Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. It is a 27-unit building with five vacancies. There is a unit mixture of six one-bedroom, five two-bedroom, and 16 three-bedroom apartments. These are occupied by 12 shareholders who pay 693 per month in maintenance, as well as 10 renters who pay between $804 for a one-bedroom unit and $1,260 for a two-bedroom unit. 
The two commercial spaces are currently occupied by a deli grocery store and an electronics store. The property was on the initial list of eligible buildings in round 10 of HPD's third-party transfer program due to mismanagement by a non-functioning board that failed to raise maintenance fees, which, coupled with low collections rates, resulted in an inability to meet financial obligations. HPD's asset management team worked with the HDFC before transfer, uh, oh, sorry, before the transfer through TPT would have been required to help them reach the required milestones to be removed from the program and retain ownership of the property. Um, we included a checklist for your reference with the testimony. Don't uh, have it. It should have, it's not with what you... I found it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so with HPD, the shareholders worked out a plan to save their building. Those efforts include modifying the original mortgage, executing a new regulatory agreement with HPD, electing a new board, developing a marketing plan to sell vacant units, creating payment plans to address municipal arrears, including property taxes, water and sewer charges, and commercial arrears, and developing a five-year financial plan to ensure the building's long-term financial health. This plan mandates a 2% annual increase of rent and maintenance and $200 per residential unit designated annually to the building's reserve account. Vacant units will be marketed to households making up to 120% of AMI. Additionally, they will address their few housing code violations, which will be cleared from HPD's database. In order to keep the property free of such violations in the future, the property manager and the board have developed a plan to make routine repairs as needed with funds set aside from the increase in cash flow. Because the HDFC met these milestones, HPD removed the building from TPT Round 10, and it remains privately owned. In an effort to help maintain continued affordability and stability in the building, HPD is before the council seeking retroactive tax benefits dating back to 2010 and for a term of 40 years that will coincide with a regulatory agreement establishing certain controls over the property, such as mandating annual maintenance increases and hiring of a third-party manager. They've already hired the new management company, ADCNY Realty Corp. The cumulative value of the tax benefits for the 40-year term is $2,506,331, and the net present value is $1,090,984. In your testimony, you said this was LU-529. I believe the correct LU number is LU-258. Can you oh, I'm that? sorry. So this is LU-258. I'm sorry. We have the wrong thing in the testimony. We can send you an updated version. I'm not sure why that happened. I believe your cumulative value for the 40-year term is low for a net present value of a million dollars. I think it's because the of the... Uh, You're running it versus if the, the partial had continued. I'm sorry, what? Why do you believe, why do you believe the, net, the, the cumulative value should only be 2.5 while the net present is a million? I think it's because the net present um, takes into account the, the uh, retroactive as well. How much is the uh, how much is the retroactive tax abatement? I have that one second. Three hundred and ninety-seven thousand nine hundred and seventy-six dollars. That's what was owed as of October. Uh, they've been paying it down, so it could actually be less. I'm gonna we're gonna dig in on third party, but before we do, we're going to uh, ask the committee council to call the roll on the first two land use items. On, LU, uh, on LUs 232 and LU uh, 240, vote to approve. Councilmember Kalos? Aye. Councilmember Deutsch? Aye. Councilmember Diaz? Aye. By a vote of three in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with zero abstentions, the vote is held open. I want to thank both of my colleagues, and I will urge them to get back to their districts. Uh, that snow is really coming down, and I know that uh, Councilmember Chaim Deutsch will probably be out there with a shovel for his constituents and helping people uh, with any cars that may get stuck. So <laughs> thank you very much for the great work you do. Uh, well, how much was the uh, taxes? 397976 And uh, That was as of October. And part of it is the tenants have already started to repay it at the same time as we're about to approve removing that whole 390. Well, they got into payment plans as far as I understand for all. Luis for, is the project manager, by the way, so, so he's has, here to help answer Are questions. they going to pay it off or are we forgiving the 390000 
Oh, let me just check how much it is for only the, the only portions that we're forgiving is the property taxes. Uh, any water that How much is the water bill? And are they, are they being forgiven for their payment agreement for the back taxes? So any, any payment agreements with back taxes, that would be credited. So once the, if the Article 11 were to expire, say, in 40 years, whatever they paid before would be given as a tax credit. So they wouldn't lose that, that money that they used to pay their taxes. In 40 years they'll get it or they'll get it back now? Well, they wouldn't get a check right now. It would just be a, a credit. Okay, sure. Uh, so it's about 490, and then the. So you're you're assuming the cumulative is like 600, six five or six hundred thousand dollars for the moving forward tax benefit. We don't have that exact breakdown. We can get that for you. Yes, please. I think it should be in the tax benefit analysis, but I don't I am very grateful to HPD for removing this building from third party transfer. Uh, I, I believe I have raised concerns about, I think the third party transfer program is a useful tool, but I'm concerned any time that we're taking a home ownership opportunity away from somebody and uh, transferring it into a, a rental situation. Are the HDFC tenants going to maintain their ownership, those that are owners? Yes. Uh, the rental tenants, will they maintain as rental tenants or will they have a home ownership opportunity? They will have the option to purchase into the building. Uh, are there any tenants uh, who Subject are to board approval. Sorry. Does, are any of the tenants going to be excluded due to the fact that they earn more than 120% of AMI? No. What is the current AMI of the tenants? So all the tenants fall within the uh, income limits. Um, let me see if I can find that sheet for you right now. But um, I have This is a small building, so I'm not sure what kind of level of detail that we can share beyond that because of privacy reasons. Um, but to know a band? can say that they're all well under. They're definitely well under 120% AMI. Uh, there are vacant units in this building? Correct. Yes. At 120% <coughs> of AMI, that could be a single individual making uh, $86,000 or a family of six earning $144,000. Christ. Well, the unit sizes are, are they all one and two bedrooms? So they have three would, bedrooms also. Oh, one, two, um, and three. So you probably wouldn't have a family of six. Well, I guess for well, three you could. So, so you don't. Sorry. When it comes to how many family members you can have in an apartment, there's no specific number that you have to use for a single bedroom. So you could have two or a family of up to four, I believe. Is, is, the, is the right number here 120% of AMI, or is the right number here lower? Well, so the 120% AMI is the cap um, for what the vacant units can be sold for. Um, but we anticipate that it will, the actual sale price will be significantly below what that cap is set at, just due to the market I, I believe and based it is on within, some recent it, sales I in the building. I believe it is within the land use purview to determine whether or not the units will be affordable to folks in the neighborhood. And so I, I appreciate that you're giving a commitment to be well below. My question is just how much further below to the extent you're not willing to reveal the AMIs of the people living in the building. I understand what is the AMIs for people in the surrounding census tract. It's about th between 30 and 40 percent. So that's in the in the community, not the census 000. tract to be clear. Sorry, we don't have it that specific. So in the community people, so 30 to 40 percent is 21,930 to 29,240 for individuals. And if it was a family of six, that would be 36,300 to 48,400. Uh, so I guess given the fact that the community is actually four times lower at its lower bound than that 120% of AMI is HPD committed to making vacant units at that range, at that 30 to 40 range 
I mean, I think right now the sales price, it's, it's, a, it's a calculation, you know, that the board needs to make with their uh, management company about the price that they need to, um, you know, maintain the building, um, taking into consideration what the market will, will bear. All we set is the ceiling. And I'm asking if you can set a, a lower ceiling. So the the only thing that I could say was that we could negotiate that with the uh, with with the building, with the corporation, to see if they were willing to go to a lower AMI. I mean, we're always welcoming a lower AMI. The only ceiling that we put was 120. If they want to go to 80% AMI, we can amend the uh, regulatory agreement. But I think, you know, this is pretty standard for how we do this kind of transaction, and I think it's just because this is a 40-year regulatory agreement, things can change over time. We want to allow them flexibility, but I think that we can say with confidence that based on recent sales, um, th if you know they have now a five-year plan to market the vacant units, so they're going to be doing that pretty proactively in the very near future. And you know, based on what the market has borne um, for sales in this building that happened fairly recently, I think we can confidently say that the sales will be lower than this ceiling by quite a bit if they're anything like the recent sales prices. The current rent is six, sorry, the current maintenance is six ninety three. You're including that increasing that by two percent moving forward as well as two hundred dollars per residential unit, so is that going to be a, a one-time fee per year or is it going to be spread out across the each monthly payment? Uh, the $200 would be a one-time fee per year into a reserve account that the building will hold in a bank. In other situations, I've s seen certain tenant protections where tenants were limited to paying no more than a certain percentage of their income. Will tenants in this building be able to uh, have access to that resource? I believe you call it project based section eight. I don't know if it's available for HDFC situations. We're not using vouchers um, in this building. Uh, the, the project based section eight is for rentals, uh, but um, is, is there something so, on this restructuring that takes their current incomes into account? So unfortunately, uh, renters in HDFC co-ops are not rent protected. So. Right, but we're, we're assuming that they're going to be given the option to purchase into the building. Correct. And I think ultimately that's, well, I don't want to speak for the board, but. If somebody re does not take, the, how much will they have to buy their unit for? Is it $250 to purchase this or $2,500? What is the purchase cost for tenants? So it will be, in this case, they wouldn't have the option to buy for 250 That was what the original shareholders had the ability to. Um, the board will have to set the, uh, the prices. Uh, now, the last two units, they were sold for about $30,000, I believe. Um, it really depends on the conditions of the apartment and what the market is willing to offer. And under the new regulatory regime, if a unit is purchased, if a three-bedroom is purchased at the 120% AMI level, what is that going to be? I can tell you right now. Um, give me one second. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't have the schedule with me, but it would be roughly, I would say, about four hundred thousand dollars. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you? I, yeah. You were asking about. I was like still thinking about the rental question. You were asking about the maximum sale price. I was. I was actually going to double back to the rental question. After oh, sorry. Asking just okay. So if it's at four hundred thousand, is HPD going to assist the folks with purchasing if they don't have access to credit or don't have access to loans? I don't know of any program that we have that has funds available like that. Okay, so I guess to the extent that it is likely that people will still maintain as renters, what will what protections will they have moving forward as part of the new regulatory agreement? For the ten renters, what will their rents be? And who will they be renting from? 
So right now they will be renting from the corporation. Okay, and so what protections will they receive? As a renter, they currently do not have a protection against maintenance increases. So if the board decides- They don't pay maintenance, they just pay rent. Oh, sorry, uh, rent increases. But the, the five-year plan is actually mandating the 2% annual increase for the, it's rent and maintenance. It's the same schedule for both. That's part of the regulatory agreement. So renters will, because the rents are higher than the maintenance, renters will actually bear a bigger brunt of the increases. That, that, is, that is correct. That Does HPD have a program that can be rolled out for people in HDF, HDFCs that are, are going into this type of situation? It seems like the, the owners will receive windfalls, but the folks who are currently renting will not and will bear more of the burden and won't even necessarily be able to purchase the apartments. We can check on that. I'm not sure if there's a program but that they can access. You can double check with the team on that. It stands to reason, is there a reason why HPD wouldn't allow the 10 renters to just be grandfathered in to buy in at the previous shareholder rate? Who are they currently paying rent to? To the, to the corporation. Are, I believe this is the first instance I've ever heard of where the HDFC had tenants, at least since i Sometimes I've, it's not that uncommon to have both. Why wouldn't the HDFC just make the unit available for s sale? Well, ideally, our goal would be to reach 100% shareholder occupancy. However, that just is not usually the case in HDFC co-ops. And the way that the laws are set up, they don't have has a requirement to have 100% shareholder occupancy. I mean, under the spirit of which the the HDFCs were created, yes, that's that's what we saw, but that's not the reality at the moment. And shareholders are not, and uh, renters are not necessarily protected from rent increases. Uh, committee council, please continue calling the roll. On items LU 232 and LU 240, Council Member Gibson, how do you vote? I vote aye. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Please uh, travel safely uh, home to the Bronx and uh, An hour and a half. just stay, stay, stay away from the slippery roads and be cautious, please. The snow is really coming down. I, it seems just in our conversation right now, it seems that you, may, you would agree that it is important that tenants receiving, tenants where the landlord is receiving subsidies from the city for affordable housing should be protected in their affordable housing and should have more than what you're saying, no protections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why the goal is to get to 100% shareholder occupancy. Um, I just don't know right now if they're like what assistance we can offer, if any, to those renters. I, we can, I can find that out and get back to you. I, I believe you and I know that you're earnest and I would like HPD to come back if necessary, with a regulatory agreement that says that these tenants have protections. I, I'm not sure why they don't have rent regulation given the age of these buildings. <coughs> uh, these, and the amounts of rent and the ages of these buildings would make me believe that this should be covered by rent regulation, especially since this was a 1978 building. There a reason why they sh isn't, but they aren't. So I'm I'm not an expert, but I think just because of the law, the co-ops don't have that same protection as rental buildings. Okay, uh, but you're open to trying to see if there's a way to do it through the regulatory agreement. Yes, we'll we'll discuss that. Mm -hmm. When third part when a building goes through third party transfer, you deal with the rent arrears. Sorry, with the tax arrears, you deal with the water arrears, those get waived when it gets transferred to, uh, uh, to, to a third party nonprofit. It then gets handed to a real estate developer along with the tax abatement. So this is following very similarly. However, if I understand in third party transfer, uh, they also have access to uh, loans from HPD. I believe the average target is $90,000, mm -hmm. though that that number can change. Is that accurate? That sounds about right. Is, uh, wait. 
I don't have the TPT term sheet in front of me, sorry. Okay, if, if my memory serves, it is 90,000 per unit. Uh, and so I guess the question is, do the units in this building need additional renovation? Does the building need any work? And uh, <coughs> is there any ability to offer the tenants here similar incentives as you offer for-profit developers to take over? So the violations in this building are pretty minimal. It's something that we think that they can address without HPD subsidy. Um, but I would say in general, um, if you look at the checklist that uh, we attach to the testimony, one of the things um, for helping er, that these buildings need to do uh, in general to come out of uh, TPT is to create a plan to address um, code violations and sometimes when they are significant enough uh, to necessitate you know, a, a real rehab plan, what we will do is um, route those buildings to one of our uh, programs for, like for example, uh, multi, uh, multi-family housing rehabilitation loan, green housing preservation program, or the participation loan program. I brought all of those term sheets, which I can submit if you want. Um, but so basically, it's not it's not off the table for these buildings to also access, um, you know, HPD uh, loans and help with doing that work. Um, I don't yeah. mean to contradict you. Um, the team here did some pretty great work on this, and they noticed that there were six open violations, including five B violations. Right, and the and the and so the, the board has created a plan to address them. Okay. Are there any commercial property tax arrears? There are. Um, and is there a plan in place to address those? Yes, arrears? there is about almost fourteen thousand dollars. They have the reserve funds, and they're working on a payment plan for that. Are there emergency repair program charges on the property? No. It appears there's not going to be construction, but if there is, will tenants be able to remain in place? The construction shouldn't, if, if anything, it's not going to be significant enough to require anyone to move. Will there be a flip tax, or are the people who live in this building going to be able to sell their units at market rate if they want to? There is, a, there is a flip tax under the regulatory agreement, which is a 70-30 split. 70-30 of the profit goes towards the shareholder. 30% is retained by the, by the co-op. In your testimony, you indicated that there would be a new management company, ADCNY Realty Corp. Is ADCNY Realty Corp a for-profit, non-profit? Is it an MWBE? If it is not certified, do you happen to know the makeup of the board? No, so th this is the first time that I actually hear of them, but um, when they come to sign the regulatory agreement, when the HDFC comes to sign the regulatory agreement, we will have to request the uh, management company to become certified with HPD. So they'll have to submit a uh, RFQ um, and a request for qualification. And just, we will have to verify that they are, you know, up to standards. And are the tenants supporting this uh, change? They are. Great. Uh, there are a number of HDFCs that were transferred outside of uh, in the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens, uh, is there, and I believe they currently reside with Neighborhood Restore. I also understand, based on a previous hearing, that HPD has a, a controlling interest and votes on Neighborhood Restore, su such to say that they are not necessarily an independent entity, but they follow the direction of HPD. Is there any opportunity for more HDFCs to follow this laudable steps of uh, being, I, I believe at the hearing you wouldn't actually commit in all finality to who would get the properties as part of third party transfer. What opportunity is there for this model to occur with other HDFCs that may have already been transferred to Neighborhood Restore? I mean, for the ones that have been transferred, that's the outcome. I mean, the, the reason that this building was able to come out was that they were able to, you know, meet the 
all of the things that are on this checklist. And those other buildings were not able to do that in the same way. And that's why they remained in round 10. I, I would ask that HPD seriously consider looking at least at the HDFCs to see if those HDFCs, and, and I think just, you've done a good thing here. I think it's a great model. I would love to see it. And I, I challenge anyone watching to go watch the hearing, I believe from August or July where we went it would have been August because I was back from paternity leave, uh, where we really dug in. And I, I believe the deputy commissioner said that it is up to HP, it, it is up to Neighborhood Restore and HPD to determine who ultimately receives the properties and that the, the list that was provided to the council was still subject to change. Mm -hmm. So I don't see why a for-profit developer or a non-profit developer needs to take somebody's cooperative when it could be given back to them. I want to thank you. There's additional items that you need to submit. Please do so. Uh, are there any members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item 258, and the application will be laid over. Uh, there are some people in government who feel that if it rains or there's bad weather that they sh shouldn't have to show up places. Uh, it's currently snowing. It's expected to be pretty bad. I want to thank HPD for being here. I'm proud to be here, and I hope that people at the highest levels of government will begin showing up to their previously scheduled <laughs> engagements, particularly when it's honoring veterans around Veterans Day. I can't think of anything more. Uh, we will hold the uh, vote open. Uh, Amy, I'm going to let the council gavel out, please. No, he can gavel out. I'm just going to leave. I don't know if he's really going to make it. Could we just? I'm just trying to get confirmation. Can you just keep it open for a few minutes, and then I'll let you gavel out? But he can gavel out. I don't know if he can show up. I know. I'm saying. No, we can't. We can't. Yeah. We need a member. I've had other councils gavel me out. This is land use. <laughs> he's in the building. One minute. We are uh, awaiting one last vote. All the mics off. Oh, Committee clerk, please call the continue calling the roll. On LU 232 and LU 234, Council Member King, how do you vote? I vote aye. By a vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, the items are approved and recommended to the Folio Land Use Committee. Thank you, Council Member King, for braving the elements, unlike uh, a certain leader of the, not leader, uh, a person who is higher up in the federal government than uh, any of us are. A little rain might scare that person off. This concludes today's hearing. I'd like to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned.